I met Daryl several years ago, and I, I really underestimated the extent of the problem that we had with predators. And Daryl is uh, the resident expert redneck when it comes to resolving this problem on your property. So we, we have used his services. He has trained our staff. We have full-time people that all they do is catch predators. And so this is a really important part of what you do. And Daryl's going to be able to share some great information with you. And I would encourage you, if you don't have anybody doing this on your property today and you have exotics, you are losing money. I guarantee you. And he's a great person to hire to train your staff or for that matter to just simply help you with what you're doing. So come on up, Daryl. Do you want this or do you want this? I got, I got the yes. Okay. I guess it'll work. Predator control. Uh, what we do is we design a custom predator program for your particular ranch, because not all ranches are the same. All the coyotes, they're a little bit different uh, every kind, everywhere you go. A lot of them had a lot of different things thrown at them, and uh, that, can make it, that can make it very difficult. Uh, now, as Mr. Gilroy said, you know, uh, you, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not here to brag on myself at all. Uh, I'm, all, I, all I'm here to do is try to educate, you know, the best I can on a predator control program, and that's what we're going to start today. A predator control program, it, like I said, it is a, uh, is a program for your ranch that is designed for you. The terrain's going to be different. The coyotes are going to be different. The, the animals are going to be different. Some animals are more susceptible to uh, predators than others. Let's see. Set up. When, when you decide that you want to do a predator control gr program, this is what it's going to take. There is no deviation from this. Uh, if you want the most for your animals, the most for your money, then this is how it's done. We have been doing this for about 25 years, and I'm going to tell you all today exactly how it works. You set up the steps that you would take to attain the ranching goals to protect your investment. The length of it is from January to August, about six months. Now, when I say January 1st, I mean January 1st. It's not March 1st, May 1st, or anything else, because when you do January 1st, it, you're getting on that bunch of coyotes uh, that are there. They go through different different cycles, and if you miss a cycle, you're behind. The goals of it is to target as many of the breeding females as possible to get to get the uh, get the population down. Uh, the female kind of le leads the leads the bunch. Uh, she is, she is actually the one you want to get. Uh, she is the puppy making machine, and uh, she, she is very important to get on, the, on, this, uh, on this whole ordeal. I'll get all this straight here in a minute, let's see. Prevent loss of livestock. Cows is what, what they do. They come in and different things, you know, they start taking your livestock and they don't, they don't really realize, you know, they don't care that it's an expensive animal or a non-expensive animal. If they start in on your females, then it's going to, they're building up to get a really expensive animal. Ensure the offspring and protect the offspring. Now, I do have two little things here I want to read really quick. One of them is for uh, Philip Hernandez, uh, owner of Bar 4 Exotics. Uh, this is, this is what he sent me. This was talked about, but I like this the most. Had no idea how many coyotes we had that first year. Thereafter, the same effort is required just for maintenance. They don't have to worry about eradication because there's not enough widespread control to accomplish that. The business of raising these animals in pens and high fence ranches creates the advantage to the predator. The game raised are not as wild, and the containment hinders, hinders escape. Control work is not an option, it's an, imp it's an imperative. 
That was, uh, now I'm gonna write another one here. That is from uh, Chris Block at Marathon Pines. When we first installed our high gain fence, we basically thought the fence and the skirt would keep the coyotes out. We keep finding carcasses around the property. The worst thing is feet, is the worst thing feeling is buying a, a, a trophy buck and having them attacked by a coyote within 48 hours. We figured out the fence was not keeping them out and we definitely weren't the best at taking care of the problem. Something had to be done and that's when Darrell was highly recommended. He started in early 2019 taking care of our predator issues and he has done an incredible job. <clears throat> our herds are thriving and looking better each year. They're definitely an art to trapping and Darrell has it perfected down. Uh, Chris Block. All right. We're gonna move on into this, guys. I don't, I don't have a lot of time today, and uh, like I said, we're just gonna go straight into the meat of this. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not gonna go into, you know, the past of it and things like into that. These, these are the steps that we're gonna have to take to ensure that your livestock survives predation. Set up a control program. That means you've, got, you've got the area scouted out. You know what's in there. You know all the trails. The animals are there and all that. That makes, that is very important. Target the breeding females, as I talked about. You know, if you're gonna get her, you gotta get her early before she, before she has those pups. You gotta get her while them pups are still in her belly. Breeding season on them is right around, right around Valentine's Day and they're in about 60 day uh, gestation period. What you need to do is you need to decrease the resident predator population. They're like a giant honeycomb if you look at their home ranges. Now home ranges, what we think is a home range is we think of a boundary, a fence, a road, a property line. Their boundaries are something like Toledo Bend, you know, something huge, something they can't just sit up here and walk across. A railroad track, I assure you, is not a boundary. A high fence is not a boundary to them. They have no problem going in. They, can, they get up about that high on their back feet and just slither right on through. Rules for this right here. Pay attention to the terrain, the vegetation, and the access to the property. Do set up steps correctly to maintain effectiveness. You finish just like you start. If you go in here and you start you know, halfway doing it, stuff like into that, then man, it just starts falling apart on you quick. January and February is when you have got to wipe them out. And a lot of people's like, well, you know, we're still deer hunting. We're, we're still this, we're still that. You know, having a control guy in there that time of year is not gonna hinder your deer hunting. It's not gonna hunter, hinder any of your hunting at all. Just communicate with them. Hey, we got hunters on such and such day. We'll run your stuff for you. I anything, but this, those two months right there is the most important of it all. March. Now, your females are gonna start getting bred, uh, should already be bred. So what you wanna do is you wanna say, hey, all right, when you catch a female, you wanna cut her open, you wanna check her tubes, uh, you wanna check her stomach contents to see what's going on, you know, what are they feeding on? You know, if in case you have one that has killed, that's the way you're gonna confirm it. Continue to monitor travel routes. They all are predictable. Every one of them is gonna be just as predictable as the next. You can, you can take an old sand bed or something and you can go straight to it. And there's where you're gonna find your tracks. Do you have any left? When you stop seeing tracks, uh, you know, you know, well, I've got them down for right now. So uh, it kind of gives your animals a little bit of break also, you know, ain't nothing in there messing with them night and day. Uh, but, you know, if you lose them and say so you're starting to have a, you're starting to have a little downward power not catching as many, which you should by this point in time. If you've done it right, you should, you should start seeing a decrease in March. Uh, continue to monitor the travel routes is basically you just gotta track them. Keep track of what's, what's moving through your area. Targeting females makes the biggest difference. I've talked about that is uh, I killed one last month 
and uh, she was, they were losing animals right in the front yard. And uh, I was, you know, I was really skeptical it was their dog, and it turned out it kind of was their dog, but they were still in panic about it. Uh, they were seeing some coyote tracks, whatever, so we snared a, uh, we snared a female uh, the first, first night in there, and we cut her open, she had nine pups in her. Uh, now, you take one that's got nine pups, you have four of them that does that, you know, say four of them live, that's a lot of coyotes there. That's, that's how they reproduce so fast, you know, is you're never gonna run out of them. You're, you're, they're always gonna be here, you're gonna have to contend with them. April is a weird month, it really is. Uh, now she's gonna be in a hole. If, if she survived it, your breeding females are gonna be in a den somewhere. They're, they, they're gonna be having pups, they're not be, gonna be traveling as far. They're just gonna kinda of stay right around there. The male, he gonna have to get out and hunt alone. Sometimes he don't go as far. He don't wanna leave her very much. Um, so the way you, the significance about that is, is if she's in a den, he's hunting by himself and he has to make a round through your equipment, he won't come back, all right? So this goes on for a little bit. Uh, she's gonna have to come out of that den and now she don't come back. And that is, um, I know it sounds pretty rough and all, but that's just, that's just part of it. I mean, you know, we're either gonna raise exotics or we're gonna raise coyotes. There, there ain't no, uh, there ain't no uh, middle ground with it. The dry pairs are gonna start moving in on you. Uh, those are the pairs that didn't, uh, didn't get bred. The younger ones, something may or not have came in heat at that point in time. Uh, and, or may have just got missed or passed over. We don't, we don't know what happened. But now, once you open up an area and you say you've taken the residence, uh, then these here is just gonna start drifting in. The best thing about them is they're extremely curious whenever they come through and they generally don't last very long. They'll go around and everything in that area, they're gonna smell it. So if you've caught coyotes here, they're gonna go over there and they're gonna smell it. They, they don't know what's going on. The worst thing that we ever did with a coyote is we gave him a college degree before we ever under, tried to understand him. You know, he, he was this, you know, and I've, I've talked to people, you know, that talk about coyotes were just this shape-shifting, you know, you couldn't catch them. They were, they were impossible to catch. You couldn't hold them in a trap. Well, you know, they're, they're, it's just a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff there that just never was supposed to, supposed to have been. They wasn't, they, they didn't have the knowledge that we have today. They didn't have the equipment constructed today of a, what can hold one, what, what can keep him there. You know, I know Denning, Denning's kind of a controversial subject, but what you do is this time of the year, she's in that den this time, uh, first, far of May, first of May and all that. Uh, you go out here early in the mornings, very, before daylight, you see if you can get them to howl back at you. Uh, if they howl at you, you know where that, they're, they're gonna be at the den or pretty daggum close to it. So then you move in on them and you move in on them, you, you get with them where you think you're about 100 yards where you heard them at. You try to set up on them and call them. And this time of year, uh, don't worry about your rabbits, don't worry about your squalling uh, birds and stuff like in that. Pick a fight with him. You know, another male's gonna come in his area and they're not, they're not gonna put up with it that close to that den and they're gonna come out and they're gonna fight him. So what you do is you call them out. If she comes out, you kill her first. Uh, you shoot her first, the male, he'll run off, sit there a little while, he's gonna come back and check on her, kill him. The den will die out. That's, that's the way we do it. So going out here, trying to take a helicopter or airplane and trying to find an 18 inch hole, you know, in 15 square miles, uh, you, you've got to, there's it's just better ways to do it than the way they used to do it. You know, they take a shovel and go out here and try to dig them out, and they take a long cable and run down there and try to pull them out. You know, and it was it was a mess. This is way more effective, and it, and it really works. May. The 
this is that coyote there that uh, I cut the nine pups out of the other day. Uh, so, and I, I mean, they were all pretty viable. The dry pairs should move in and can be picked up pretty easily. Like I say, they're gonna come in, they're gonna drift around, they're gonna find your equipment, they're real curious. You know, if you do it right, I'm telling you, they just fall in them. New pups located in a den with a female. Uh, she's, she's not gonna get out very far. So uh, that, that's why you may have to do the denning on them. Male will be, he and now this time of year, he's gonna start getting a little further away from him. Pups start getting a little size on them. Uh, you know, they crawling all over him and all that stuff. He bites one or two of them, she'll run him off. He's still gonna be in the area, but she's gonna write, he's gonna stay a little bit further away. So his, his circles are gonna be getting bigger. So now this time of year, they're gonna start coming back. You know, your old big single males, they're gonna start drifting back through there. Well, uh, same thing. If he's not hunting, she's gotta leave that den. And uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot to know, I know it is. But uh, it's just something that has to be, you know, studied and, and a lot of a lot of track and a lot of time spent on them. This time of year, you want to switch to the hot weather sets and lures. You want to. There is a difference between lures. People's like, well, you know, I, I tore them up with this lure back back in the winter, but now it's shut off. Well, now you got to swap to something else that they want to fool with. They're not. This time of year, they're picking up rabbits. They're picking up all kinds of little stuff, you know. Uh, it's just, they're, they're not starving. So you take this right here. Uh, you go into a more of a curiosity type lure, something that, that has a different smell that you haven't used the rest of the year. Well, they go up in there and they want to rub on it. And uh, they want to get that stuff on them. They're not actually wanting, trying to eat it. They're wanting to try to rub on it. You'll see them up here where they'll try to drop their shoulders and they'll, they'll try to get down here and rub it on, rub it on their necks and stuff. So uh, if you'll swap to your hot weather lures that time of the year, you're going to see that you can pick them, you, you can pick some more of them up that, uh, instead of just staying with the winter type, cold weather stuff. June. Move equipment out of the fawning areas uh, and prepare for the arrival of the new babies. Uh, now this is mostly whitetail stuff here that I'm, I mostly deal with whitetails all the time. Um, so you don't want your traps in here exactly where she's gonna be bringing her fawns around. Uh, you move them to the outside of a fence. You put kind of a put of a barrier in there where you're at and uh, so your fawns are hitting the ground. Uh, coyotes are going, they know it. They're going to move on them. And whoever said this, you know, that fawns don't have any scent. I don't know where that came from. That was something that, you know, somebody else came up with. But they can smell them. So you'll go out here and they'll smell that old doe. And they'll trail her right back to where she went. So, and uh, pick it up. July. You're going to be dealing with the stragglers. The last of the old outlaws. The ones that just kind of mess around and they're, they're not been in there all year. You, you know, you'll have an old male that's kind of been whooped off. He's just kind of by himself. And you'll actually pick up some really big old males this time of year. And they'll just make these big old circles. They don't really have a home range. They just wander. And uh, about that time of year, you'll start seeing these guys show up. There's, no, there's not enough coyotes in there to fight him off all the time. Well, hell, he's gonna drift in there and uh, you know, and he's the same as the other ones. He's gonna come around there fooling around. He'll smell that stuff where these other coyotes have been caught. He's gonna go in there and fool with it. He don't leave. They tend to make more nomadic, make wider loops. But one thing about them, they're they old and they're carrying a lot of experience with them. And they tend to be some pretty bad killers. They really do. Uh, they will, what they'll do is they'll, they'll move around in that thing and they kill and they're gone. They kill and they're gone. They're not hanging around very much because they know if I can kill him here this easy, they're just gonna you know, go to the next place so a new coyote don't move in on him. And they go in there and they kill over there. You'll miss him. If you're not ready for him, you're gonna miss him. And most time by this time, everybody's got all their stuff put up and they ain't, they're, they're fishing. 
And that's and that's that's not doing us any good, guys. August. This is when you quit. This is kind of whenever you take a break and say, you know, I've been going seven days a week, fifteen hours a day, and it's it's time to it's time to put it all up. So you're gonna pull your equipment, get it cleaned up, keep your snares working in the fence. Uh, you know, I didn't just say, hey, y'all run the snares, we're through, y'all just go on in here. What we have done is we have we have created a hole that your babies now is about 10 weeks old. They're not just a walking sandwich. Uh, and so by now, your, your fawns are either going to make it or they're not. And, uh, you know, they're up with a little size on them. And, uh, you know, they're just not near. They're more hardy. They're a lot faster. They're a lot easier, you know, to, to get away from him. And I'm going to be honest with you, a coyote is pretty lazy. Uh, he don't. He, he, he's not going to try real hard after one thing, you know. Um, he, he's going he's gonna to pick up the quickest, easiest meal he can possibly find and just go and move on. Get all your equipment cleaned up, and that, that is the chore. Uh, that's the time. Get it all clipped, cleaned up, dipped, uh, waxed. Do all your mechanical work on them. Change springs out. Uh, make your snare, get your snares and all that stuff built. Uh, and that's that's a good time to do it. In the season, I take a vacation. I'm usually on that big cruise ship right there about sometime in August, and uh, I usually don't answer my phone a whole lot. So that's that's just kind of the end of the end of it all right there. You kind of want to get off of them about August and kind of let. Let your animals rest. Let everything else get back calm. That way your people can come in. Y'all can get more ready for deer season. Uh, you know, and, and we're out of the way. Now this is, this is the equipment that we use right here. Trap snares, M44s. Uh, these are the kind of traps that are coyote traps right here. See how they go up here. There's absolutely no damage on the foot. You've got a high catch. They don't, they don't get out of that. Uh, they're extremely strong, they're really rugged, and those are what we use. We use Bridger number three, fully modified. Uh, that over here is an M44. Those are your cyanide guns. Now, the thing about a cyanide gun is you, you, you always hear, well, so-and-so used a cyanide gun, he wiped them out. That's, that's the furthest thing in the world from the truth. Uh, there's over 800 licensed cyanide users in this state, and there's 10 of us that are good with them. We had a place up here, he had some exotics, and they had a cow pasture on the other side of it, and uh, they lost. All their, all their boiled beast babies, all the, uh, killed all the fallas, and uh, the guy was like, man, I ain't had no wild beast babies in three years. Uh, he said, I don't know, well, they just ain't breeding up, whatever. So um, he said, well, we're just going to take them out there and hunt them and kill them this year. I'm just going to sell them, you know, let, let, you know, sell them for that. I killed 53 off that 100 acres in here. There's a 100 acre stretch over there between the exotics. And it's just a pine sapling thicket. Killed 53 out of that 100 acres in about four months. And uh, this year they had three wildebeest. So, uh, I mean, they work. But uh, you, you, the thing about them, there is so much maintenance with them. And a lot of people are not changing their shells. They're not greasing them up. You know, they're not moving them when they should. They're letting their heads uh, bog, you know, bog up with dirt, stuff like into that. Well, I mean, heck, it gets so dirty, he don't want to put it in his mouth, you know, and he, he, even if he smells it. So you, want to, you got to keep them clean. Your snares, those are fence snares there that we build. They're 12 feet long. That's probably not the best picture we picked, but uh, there's a fence up there. It's the first time to work that area. I had six in a row right down that stretch of fence over right off Mervall Creek. All six of them were big, were big coyotes. Uh, but the thing about them is, is they're long enough and they have kill springs on them. And I'll tell you what, whenever they lock down, there ain't no backing out. Uh, they are wind stoppers. They're killing coyotes. They're not cable restraints or anything like into that. And that's the way you want them right there. Whenever you pull up, you want them dead. You don't want water heads. You don't want all this swelling up. You don't want them chewing out. 
when they hit the end of that thing, uh, they did a study on them deals up in Montana years ago, and they said within within 80 seconds, the coyote was already dead on his side. So uh, that's the way that we make them. Baits and lures. Well, let's go. Rifles and ammunition. This is what I want to talk about real quick. Rifles is whatever you want, but uh, I use a 223 bolt action with a uh, 55 grain ballistic tip in it. Uh, I don't want a real complicated anything, and I, I've got to, you know, I've got, I know that stuff's kind of fun and all that stuff. But as far as uh, rifles go, you want a very simple scope. You do not want all these knobs and buttons and all this stuff all the way out on them. Because when that coyote comes running in there, you know, and I, actually I got a buddy, he's into all that, and he wanted to go hunting. We well, hunted a time or two. And here comes a coyote. We called him right into us. He goes to flipping and turning knobs and everything else. I mean, by the time he got all that done, he was gone. You know, when he comes in there, you want to kill him. You don't want him. A calling works one time, and you better kill, you better kill him then. Don't let him learn. Uh, baits and lures. Baits and lures, there's a difference. Bait is something that he wants to he wants to kind of put his mouth on. He he wants to get down here and do that. So if there is a ton of food around, you know, you probably don't want to use bait. Uh, you know, if things are, you know, at certain times of the year, bait really shines. Lures, they're they're more something he wants to go up here and he wants to urinate on. He wants to he wants to drop his shoulder and rub on it. He wants to, he wants to get it on the side of his neck, stuff like into that. And they play with them a pretty good little while. Uh, scouting sign. You got to know where they're at. You've got to know where they're at. You got to know where they're coming in. You got to know where the holes are. You you need to know where you know the, the most rocky denning areas are. You want to get between. You want to get between him and your animals, and that's where you want to catch him at. You don't want to catch him up here in the middle of your animals. You want to catch him before he gets to them. And that's, that's a big thing, and that's, I think that's why we have been so successful with it. It's because we do, we try to get between them and your animals. Now these are kills. This first one right here was this year. He had five of those big bucks about about a week before bow season. And it was a bad song gun, I'm here to tell you. Uh, he killed five of them bucks just like that. If you'll notice, the way that they kill them, that ham up that back flank, the flank, most of the time there, the guts and stuff like that will be pulled out of them and he'll just be hollered out. A lot of people, think they look at it and they're like, well, you know, as, as he just walked over here and died. You check that throat up under here. And you'll, you, sometimes you can't see it. Sometimes you got to cut it open and, and open it up, and you'll see his windpipe been crushed. And that's, that's a big deal. Uh, that second one was bobcat killed. I think that was killed down here on Gilroy's a couple years ago, uh, down there in, uh, Pet, uh, not Pettis, uh, what was that other place? Pearsall. Pearsall. That was a bobcat killed, that one. And uh, I wish you could see it better. But when a cat kills him, he gets him here by the muzzle. And you see how his muzzles all tore back? Uh, that, that's how they're killed. He eat a big chunk out of him and then left him. A lot of times they'll, the younger cats, we, we notice this, the younger cats will try to cover them up. They'll get back up here and they'll try to drag them off and cover them up. An older cat, he may get back here and he may kick a foot full of dirt over it and he just goes on. He's like, I don't care, I'll just go kill another. And I ain't, I'm not worried about him. Uh, yeah, those are those are those four cows there. The one we caught out of this first pasture right here with uh with that one there, that first buck. That's a picture of, of a kill. Uh, uh, you couldn't tell it until we we opened her throat up, and you can see right there how our windpipe is crushed. That that's just something you know that uh, a lot of times you don't see. That's how you can confirm it. It's not a buzzard kill. Uh, stuff like into that. It, that is a coyote kill. The second one over here, you, everybody's like, "Well, they don't eat fawns. Well, they don't. They don't do this with fawns. They don't. 
uh, you know, they can't smell them. That is a complete white tail fawn that was in a coyote's stomach. There's the feet. This over here on the far end is the tail. This right here by his front leg is the, uh, is the ears. And then that's the rest of him right there. You know, and they're all like, well, they don't eat bones. They don't eat bones. Well, let me tell you something. I got about an 80 pound lab sitting there around the house. He's no good for nothing, trust me. All he does is want you to feed him and lay on you. That's all he wants to do. And, uh, you know, he, he'll counter surf if you don't watch him. So uh, one day they were cooking some pork chops, and uh, he jumped up there and grabbed every one of them. Before he, before, I mean, and he's quick about it, too. You turn around, and he's got them and gone. Well, he grabbed these pork chops up and ate them. And I'm like, well... He, I mean, he eat bone and all. So, you know, you sit up here and you watch him a little while there, he'll throw that up and he'll eat it again. And he'll, he'll sit up here and he'll keep doing that until he digests it. Now, I raise, I've kept coyotes in urine pens to, uh, to collect urine off of them because, you know, you want really good urine. You can take a ham off of a 100-pound hog, go in there and throw it, throw it there at night, and they'll just lay there and look at you like this, like they never move. The next morning, you're gone. It, the whole mess is gone. The feet, the hair, it's all gone. And he's laying in the same spot like he never moved. So uh, they're eating the bones, and that's what he did. I mean, he just, he just chewed that thing up and ate her. Uh, he hadn't had it very long, but uh, we caught him right after he had it because that stuff in him was still fresh. That was a cat kill, that one. We actually got him on, those are cat kills there. As you can see, uh, that far one over here, how his nose was all uh, chewed up real bad, and he was actually, he was actually covered up. Uh, this old Axis doe was dead in a pen, and uh, Michael put a camera on her, and that's what he got. He got that cat coming in there feeding on her two or three times. He just, and that was a big tom, too. Um, he, he's going right through the fence right there. He went right on there and went to eating on her. He knew where she was. He, and that's what they do is they'll go out here and they'll lay pretty close to them and, and they'll, come, they'll feed and then they'll go lay down. And if you ever had a cat, have, ever had a house cat, you'll know how they are. They'll eat a little bit and they go lay down. And a while later they come up here wanting you to feed them again. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, he's just coming in here wanting his, wanting his afternoon snack. But yeah, I mean, he did. He went right through the fence and that was a big time. Okay, this is something there that, uh, this was one of the guys that I worked for him for about eight years. This is kind of where he started off, and my, my son-in-law did this, this graph here, and I told him I didn't know how to read it real good, but anyway, we did the best we could. For those years, uh, he lost, we had it down where he was losing maybe one to two percent a year to predation. His animals were thriving. He had 45 black buck. He had about 80, had about 80, 80 axis and several fowl. I don't remember how many he had and all, all that. Well, I worked for him for eight years. Like I say, it started here, and that's about how much he had invested in it, and it goes up, and it goes up, and it goes down a little bit, you know, and we kept it like into this. He gets a new ranch manager, and he says, well, Darrell, we don't need you no more. This kid, he's going to do it. He, he's going to, he, he said he, he can tear them up. Well, then his daughter moved out there, and, you know, I met her. She was strange, I guess you could say. I don't know. But uh, anyway, she was telling me, you know, she didn't believe in trapping. Now, she grew up in high fences. Oh, her daddy's made her living his whole life with a high fence. And she's like, well, we're going to make... We're going to make peace with the coyote. We're going to smoke some sage or whatever them damn hippies do. I don't know what they do. But uh, the, next, the next year, he lost, he lost half of them. And they didn't do anything about it. Lost half of his, all of his animals. The, uh, hey, man, we need to do something. Well, we'll smoke some more sage and... And we're going to get this tournament hunter. He's going to come in there. That's what he was doing. He was farming his thing. And, and that's, that's the only thing I got against tournament hunters is they want to farm your expensive animals so they can win a contest. That, that don't set right. You know, your animals deserve to live just as much as, much as that coyote does or whatever, or much they want, want the glory for it. So then the next year, 
he lost them all. Lost every animal he had. Well, they probably would have would have kept stopped on it, but the hippie, uh, she had her, uh, she had about seven or eight dogs. She went out there one morning. She heard a ruckus. There's two coyotes. Had her little Frenchy bulldog sitting up here playing tug of war with it right there in the backyard. So that right there is about when my phone rang right there, and it was Mr. Woods. And uh, he said, uh, he said, and he he explained the situation to me. And you know, he's like, you know, we need this done. He said, I'm, he said, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of that. He said, I've, I've told them that, you know, we're gonna do this and that's all it is to it. But you can see just how quick he lost every animal he had. I mean, he probably lost close to a million dollars. Uh, you know, and I mean, you know, and they wanna get mad, you know, cause we lose maybe one or 2% a year and, uh, but you know, the, you know. But the thing of it is, he still has his ranch hand right there as of today. Um, you know, but I mean, that's that's money. I mean, that's just money. You're, we're in this business to make money. We're not in this business to feed coyotes. Um, you know, and I know I've not done a real good job today. I've not had a lot of time to prepare. But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assure y'all one thing. Everything that is going to be talked about today is going to mean nothing unless this is handled first. The, everything that's going to go on, you're going to have that predator. He's going to kill your stuff. You're not going to make peace with him. You're not going to make a deal with him. You're not going to fence him out. I don't care what you do or, or however good a fence that you have, you're not going to fence that coyote out. He'll climb it. He'll go through it. He'll go under it. You, you've got that much slack in the gate. He's going to go through it. Uh, I've seen him crawl under cattle guard. I've seen him crawl through culverts. I mean, it's, you know, they're determined. And the only thing that's standing between you and them is going to be somebody that's more committed to killing him than he is to living. This is going to be the conclusion. I, I did this same one last year, and, uh, and I, I felt, I really feel like this sums up everything that we do. This, everything that we do is in this right here. This is dedicated to the last of the loners. The men who pursue the long, frustrating hours of unbearable heat and cold, bugs, bad smells, broken down trucks, dusty roads, cactus spines, unruly horses, mad, uh, bad suppers, and mad women, of course. Unhappy sheep men and insufferable bureaucrats, trapper who works in wildlife damage control. Uh, so with that, guys, and I do appreciate y'all's time and having me up here and putting up with me. I'm, I say I didn't have much time to prepare. I've been dynamiting beaver dams every day for the last month, and it's we have been, it's been super busy. So uh, I, thank y'all. Y'all have a great day. I just want to give you some numbers to give you some perspective. Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room have a ranch somewhere south of San Antonio. Just put your hand up if you got a place south of San Antonio. So there's a, there's a handful, okay? So we, we have a ranch in Pearsall. Um, we're, I don't know, we're 15 miles outside of Pearsall. We bought the ranch in 2018. Uh, this ranch was a, a deer breeding farm. That's, that's what they did. They raised white-tailed deer, they had pens. There were lots of big bucks on the property when we bought it, and we converted into an exotic breeding property. So you would think, that as a deer breeder having owned it for the previous 20 years that they would have done some things with predator control and things like that. So we got involved in the normal course of action for us with catching predators in 2018. I don't have our numbers for 18, 19, 20, but I do have our numbers for 22. And we killed a lot of predators in the first several years that we were there. And you would think that we wouldn't really have a problem. You would think that after years of working on it, we wouldn't have much of an issue. But the, these are the numbers from 2022. We keep track of them monthly. We keep track of them based on bobcat, coyote, hog, skunk, fox, raccoons, possums. But I'm only going to give you the bobcats and the coyotes. So in 2022, we, we uh, trapped 57 bobcats and 97 coyotes. And this is a 1,000-acre property. 
and we have big neighbors, they do trapping as well, but you think that you're actually doing something when you go put a snare on a fence and you catch a coyote once a month or every few months or you go out and you call for a little bit and you, maybe you kill one or two or things like that. It, it is, it is mind-boggling how densely populated that these animals are and, and it's different throughout Texas, but I can tell you in Pearsall, Texas, the coyotes and bobcats are alive and well and we're doing everything we can to put a stop to them because when you think about um, the amount of money that those 97 coyotes and 57 bobcats are capable of eating millions of dollars of animals a year, millions. It's not like, oh, you lost one fawn here or one fawn there. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars of animals that these, these animals are capable of killing. So at the end of last year, we start over and we start counting again, and this is May. And so far through May on that ranch, and we catch on all of our ranches, but on, on, on that ranch alone so far, we've caught another 37 this year. So I, I just, if you don't have someone doing predator control and you think that you're gonna be okay, Daryl is here to tell you that you're not. And I would really encourage you to get with him. He does do a training course where he will train your employee on how to do this because it is an art. There, there is nothing simple about it. Um, but I would really encourage you to talk to him, uh, get him to do some training for your staff. Um, and if you are really doing this in a meaningful way and it's not just a passive hobby, I would encourage you to hire someone full time to come in and do predator control. It will make a huge difference in your financial return overall. And if you don't do it, you will realize that you're not getting any production. Your breeder animals may do okay, but you're gonna figure out you don't have any offspring. And so um, don't, don't take this lightly. It's critically important to your success.